<laughs> so, I hardly need to stress to you the impact that uh, a physical disability could have on somebody's life. I'm sure that we all know and have cared for people uh, with some severe form of impairment. Perhaps we've even had some first-hand experience of this ourselves. In the UK alone, 1,000 people suffer a spinal cord injury every single year, and 150,000 a stroke. And of course, um, a loss of motor ability is one of the tragic inevitabilities of growing old, and we all know that an aging population is a reality that's facing us over the coming years. So we already see a situation where there are more people needing assistance than there are more older people needing this, and there are younger people able to provide it to them. So here in UCL Civil Engineering, we asked, how can we make cities radically more accessible to those with movement impairments? And we actually came to the conclusion that the best strategy would be to produce much better technologies to help these people in all aspects of their lives. As we know, assistive technology is relatively ancient. For example, the wheelchair has been dated back to 500 BC in ancient China, and uh, crutches and staffs have appeared all throughout a lot of ancient texts, including the Old Testament. Recent breakthroughs in material science have made these things more comfortable, more lightweight. Um, however, the real radical approach, the, uh, the most interesting development in this area, as far as I'm aware, is, of course, the robotic exoskeleton. So this is the hybrid assistive limb, or HAL, from Japan's Cyberline Corporation. This guy has been designed uh, to be able to assist people uh, doing manual labor to help them with very strenuous or repetitive tasks. You've probably all also seen similar devices being developed by the military to help soldiers when they're out in the field with extra longevity. However, this stuff has yet to make a real splash in the lives of people who need to regain uh, a more ordinary amount of independence and movement. And there are several reasons for this. I think that the, um, the chief one is because of the cost, obviously. But um, more importantly, we also have the weight of these things, the fact they're incredibly bulky and noisy, often quite inaccurate, um, the fact that they uh, have very high power requirements, and they're certainly not portable. And the reasons for all of this is because we, te we tend to traditionally think of robots as being made from motors and hydraulics and pneumatics and very sort of rigid mechanical frames and uh, these things all place fundamental limits on all of the above constraints that have stopped them becoming a widespread assistance to people who have uh, disabilities. So with our research group, we aimed to try and uh, find a radically different approach to this as well. And so we decided to try and transition from assistive robotics into an era of assistive materials. Can we develop smart materials where you can electronically change their shape and their stiffness so that in the future, your wearable assistive robots would actually be more like a smart shape morphing wetsuit that you wear underneath your clothes, and your movement could be amplified or perhaps even created from scratch just by virtue of the material itself contracting and relaxing or stiffening, in fact. For that matter, if you were wearing, say, a garment on your knee that's very flexible, but the moment you put your foot down, it were to stiffen selectively, you would then probably no longer need a walking stick that would be able to take your weight for you. So this kind of material would be extremely useful for probably all other kinds of technology that we haven't even thought of yet. Um, so, but it doesn't exist. So we've had to start from scratch. <laughs> we've been given three years um, and a decent research group, a very skilled research group, uh, to evaluate various ways in which you can create um, movement and stiffening from electricity without the need for the kind of traditional methods such as motors. So here are a couple of techniques that have already been um, in, in, in discovered. I'll go through the... Uh, pros and cons of each one. This is a dielectric elastomer. So what this is, this is a sort of stretchy plastic rubbery polymer. And um, when you place a different charge on each side of it, it causes the material to compress. And you can design a frame around this thing that constrains its movement in such a way that that compression turns into all manner of behaviors that you can program into it. So this stuff's really cool. It's very cheap. Um, it's extremely lightweight. It's silent. It's fast. It exhibits pretty high strains. It would be perfect, apart from the fact that it actually requires tens of thousands of volts to operate because it relies on <laughs> electrostatic attraction. Now, for those of you who don't know, that's enough to give you a pretty nasty electric shock. Probably not the sort of thing that you want to be developing your wearable technology from. So let's move on. Oh, this stuff's cool. This is a carbon nanotube aerogel. This was discovered by Ray Baldwin's nanotechnology group at the University of Texas in Dallas. 
Um, so these are carbon nanotubes. They're essentially sort of little tiny nanoscopic drinking straws made of rolled up graphene. And they developed ways to sort of grow them out into relatively long yarns. And this stuff is so cool because it's actually lighter than air, but it's 40 times the strength of steel. You can see in this clip, it's almost like a kind of solid black smoke that you can just pull out of a, a yarn. It's amazing. If you stretch this stuff out and electrify it, much as if you were to, say, stretch a sheet of rubber in one direction, you'll find that it contracts along the other direction. So by uh, applying a charge to these guys, they will all repel each other and cause a contraction in the opposite axis. And this produces very, very strong artificial muscles. They can lift tens of thousands of times their own weight. Uh, they're around 32 times the strength of a human muscle. But again, uh, they rely on electrostatic repulsion this time. And so they also require tens of thousands of volts to operate. So, no, no, not yet. Uh, let's move on and try a different one. <laughs> oh, this stuff, right. This was announced just earlier this year. Uh, and this is the same group from Dallas, uh, along with some international collaborators. This stuff is made just out of your standard nylon fishing line. So this stuff costs fractions of pennies to make decent artificial muscles. So they found that by twisting this stuff thousands of times over, it starts to eventually coil up like a phone cable an old phone cable in those days where they were wired. You can then stretch it, and if you heat it, due to the thermal expansion, the coil will coil itself up further and produce an artificial muscle. And this stuff truly is phenomenal, because it's so basic, and it's also hundreds of times the uh, strength of human muscle. Pound for pound, this stuff is actually more powerful than a jet engine. It's a serious, serious breakthrough. Um, however, one problem with it is the fact that it relies on heat in order to perform. And that's not what you want when you're looking at control systems, okay? Because heating something, things have a tendency, it's called hysteresis, a tendency to heat up a lot more quickly than they can cool down. And with control systems, you tend to want a very symmetric process. Um, so these things are they're very impressive, um, but it would be ideal if we could find a similar performance that doesn't rely on heating as the uh, control system. So these are some things that we've been working on at the moment. Um, these, are, these work by um, using electric... Um, potentials to move ions around through the material, okay? So as you move all the ions from one place to another, the material itself will swell in one place and it will actually shrink in another place. And so you can create uh, these strips, they're called bimorphs, where they will bend as you apply voltage to them. And you can see uh, the top one is very slow moving, but it's very, very strong. Uh, and the one down below is extremely quick, but it's quite fragile. Both of these things rely on much, much lower voltages than anything that we've seen before. One's hooked up to a 9-volt battery, and the other one to a 6-volt battery. Um, they are very nice actuators at this point. However, as we've said, one's particularly strong and one's particularly fast. So we're looking at ways to combine these two into a composite that would give us the best of both worlds. So that's uh, what we've been doing on the nanotech side of this research project. Um, where I come in, really, is uh, looking at the kind of uh, how, what architectures you can create to be able to move this simple bending motion into a repertoire of more interesting behaviors, things that are far more useful for assistive technology. So this brings us into the field of architectured materials. So uh, this is the whole idea that you can take a solid block of a material, this might be aluminum or wood, and it has a set of well-defined physical properties, like its density and its compressive strength and so on. Uh, and these are all quite intrinsic to the material. However, if you were to create a structure from that material, give it an architecture, you start to be able to explore these new parameters, these new parts of the material space. For instance, this block here, it has um, a very good uh, compressive strength, almost comparable to that of the solid block. However, it's many, many, many times lighter, and it has better thermal properties. So um, this is a field that's been around for much longer than us. I mean, look at a honeycomb. Um, this is a structure that bees have been making for a very, very long time, uh, where they can make it extremely lightweight and spacious, and also have very, very good compressive strengths. Um, however, if for us, it's really started to take off recently, as you can imagine, due to 3D printing. The fact that you can design any structure wouldn't have had to been completely impossible by older techniques of making things, and it's now within our grasp. So what architectured materials are going to be useful for making this, uh, this elusive, stiffening and shape-morphing smart material? Well, what we keep coming back to is actually this stuff. It's chain mail, much like in your medieval costumes, in medieval armor, and for people that like to these days swim with sharks. And this stuff is really interesting because it's a fabric, it's very flexible, but it's also mechanical. So a lot of my research has been looking at can you control, how, do, how can you control the shape and the flexibility of this stuff as a function of the geometry of all the linkages that it's made from. 
And the idea is we can then change those with the actuators and have a dynamically controllable material with a lot more parameters than you would with just a single actuator on its own. So how have we done this? We've actually taken a physics engine, one that's used in a lot of uh, very popular films and computer games, very high-end ones, and uh, we've designed a system where you can provide your geometry as a mathematical model for your linkage, and it will then simulate how it behaves under various forces, and it will give you a reading of how flexible this material is so that you can start to, say, program in the flexibility uh, as a function of all of these parameters and eventually change them using the actuators. We're able to uh, simulate how the um, dynamics of the material change as the geometry is changing through to actuation. Um, however, we've also found that even in the absence of actuators, this whole concept could actually still be quite useful. For example, for example, here are a couple of other designs that we've made of this kind of futuristic chainmail stuff. Uh, the top one is made out of a kind of three-dimensional block of interconnected cubes, and the bottom one's made out of these circle knot structures that appear from mathematics. And um, with the top structure in particular, we can program in the material's flexibility um, by changing the geometry of all of these blocks. We can give it, say, a particularly good um, linear flexibility, or a three-point bending flexibility, or torsional flexibility, and we can control all of these independently and make them vary throughout the material. And of course, uh, without actuators, this stuff is possible to make right now. Here's an example of the material that I've actually made using a high-end 3D printer here at UCL. And uh, it's made from laser-sintered nylon, lots of these cubic blocks. And it's a material where it's completely stiff up at this end, but it becomes gradually more and more flexible as we progress through the material. So we imagine that by doing this kind of stuff, we'll be able to make wearable items such as, say, uh, some trousers that would allow you to completely move your leg, but would lock up and go completely solid if you were moving into a pose that might result in, say, a hip dislocation. So even without any uh, fancy nanotechnology and actuators, we can already start applying this theory uh, to making products that might be able to help people an awful lot, especially if they are old and at risk of dislocations. We've developed algorithms where you can take any 3D object, including a scan of the body, uh, and immediately produce um, a kind of chainmail fitting that will, will fit it absolutely perfectly, and then can then use the previous theory to start programming in the flexibility. And but this stuff, what if it's too big? Well, we can use the physics engine to fold it up so that it will fit inside a much smaller volume inside your 3D printer. And that also reduces the time and the materials cost and the production costs. So uh, that's another nice little application that we found right there. So, to conclude, uh, it's been a bit of a journey, I'm sure. <laughs> we started from um, a problem where there's currently uh, a need for a much better solution. And we've seen that a lot of the technological solutions available uh, are kind of fundamentally not going to quite get us to where we need to be. So we've tried a completely different approach from scratch, completely throughout the rule book, and uh, we're now making some progress towards having a small patch of this material that's able to do a whole load of very, very cool stuff, and hopefully in the future we'll be making medical products out of it. This won't happen for a long time. However, I think that with, um, the lesson that you can all learn from it is perhaps that with uh, all global problems that concern every one of us, instead of just uh, settling for the solution that's currently possible, it's better to ask what is ideal and then consider why not. Thank you. <laughs>